Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of our visitors. My, it's the biggest crowd I've seen here in just a little while. Good to see all of you. Glad you could be with us today. Does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? Sounds like a silly question almost in a way to ask you today, but there was a time when it meant nothing to anyone. You know, someone happened to be standing nearby and happened to notice Jesus speaking and listening to what he had to say and noticing the rapt attention of his audience might lean and nudge the person next to him. Who is this man? They say, well, it's uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, from where? From Nazareth? Uh, never heard of him. Yeah, well, he's uh, the son of a man named Joseph, a carpenter in Nazareth, and he's uh, becoming quite a teacher. Oh, really? Actually, there was nothing particularly about Jesus that uh, would have stunned anybody in his external appearance. His name was really very ordinary. It was the equivalent today of saying, well, who is he? And saying, well, he is Joshua Josephson. Nothing unusual about that, and not a particularly unusual man. And so one might well ask, who is this man? Well, it happens as we go back in time and begin to look at this that Luke himself found it very necessary to outline for a man named Theophilus who, who this man was. Because at some later time, I think Theophilus may have already become a Christian, but there was very little in the way of written records of Jesus, of what he had done, of what he had been, of uh, what he had had to say. It was all basically carried on and carried out by uh, oral tradition. And so Luke said, Look, it's about time we sat down and, and recorded here for posterity. Who is this man? Does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? He wrote, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, which were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein you have been instructed. And so he starts, he takes him all the way back to a period of time when the name Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus or Joshua Josephson meant nothing to anyone. He describes a day when a certain priest was in his course, his normal, he was the duty officer, as it were, he was on duty. And he was in the temple at the hour of incense, and the most of the people were gathered around outside, and he was inside carrying out his duties. And all of a sudden there was a shimmering light to the right side of the altar of incense. And he stopped dead in his tracks, and then they materialized before his eyes, where a moment before there had been no one, an angel. How that angel looked to him is not described. It is just simply identified as an angel. And there's no way, frankly, of evaluating what that experience was like to a man like Zechariah. For indeed, he knew of what had happened to Samuel of old, how he had been asleep, and God had spoken to him from his bed and called him and, and commissioned him. The awareness of how God would, on occasion, uh, appear to one man or another, and here he was, just a, a, a you know an ordinary priest in the ordinary function of his duties, uh, foreseeing him, uh, of himself as being no special person. And now here is an angelic being prepared to open his mouth and speak to Zacharias. He says he was troubled and fear fell upon him, and I have little doubt of that. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zacharias, your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him, that is, before the Lord, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, it, it, you wonder that Zacharias was able to speak. You wonder that he was even able to open his mouth. Because at this point in history, there had been an expectation of the Messiah. There was a feeling that, he was, that his advent was near. But there was no consensus as to what he was really going to do where he was to come from, whose family he was to be of, what his mission would actually be. And there was, you know, all sorts of rabbinical traditions and studies and arguments and, and discussions about it with a general agreement and understanding that he was to deliver his people. Most of them felt militarily 
Most of them felt in, in terms of physical power and the establishment of the kingdom and the kicking out of the Romans. There was an awareness that this was to come, and of course to Zacharias, who knew the scriptures at this point in time, there had to be a, a sudden awareness of the imminency of the Messiah, that his advent was near, and that his son, somehow, by some crazy miracle, was going to be involved in preparing the way for the Messiah. Not that he would be the Messiah, just that he would prepare the way. Zacharias said, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife, well stricken in years, I didn't just say she's past her prime, she was old and well stricken, an interesting word that he chose to use, in years. He said, I am an old man. Not an unreasonable doubt. How shall this be? The angel answering said to him, I am Gabriel. There are very few instances in the Bible where an angel is named. This is really a, a, a unique and a very remarkable instance that this angel would identify himself by name, and that he would be Gabriel, of all people. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak to you and to show you these glad tidings. And behold, you shall be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you didn't believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Very minor penalty for his momentary and understandable doubt. I doubt if it really inconvenienced him all that much over the period of time that he waited. For indeed, when he was not able to talk, he sure had plenty of time to think and to ponder over what he had seen and to recollect the events and to wonder at the things that were going to happen to his son. He then, it says, the people waited for Zacharias and they marveled that he was in there so long. And when he came out and he could not speak to them, they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them, gestured, and remained speechless. It came to pass, as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he went to his own home. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself for five months. She didn't want anyone to know, I guess, uh, for five whole months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days where he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. And it was, of course, generally thought of as a reproach for a woman to be childless as she got to old age in this, this, that day and time. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in to her and said, Hail, you that are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. What an understatement. But, of course, what could he have said uh, to have adequately expressed what was about to take place? Highly favored by God. Blessed among women. What an astonishing thing is, is about to happen. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She cast about in her mind what, what manner of salutation this could be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. That statement alone is, it would be enough to use the vernacular, make your day, wouldn't it? To have a, an angelic you know, a being appear, to cast a blessing upon you and to say, don't be afraid, you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb, shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Joshua. Now, in a way, it's a shame that the uh, English translators decided to use the Greek version of the name rather than the Hebrew version of the name, and from that time to this, he has been known as Jesus to all of us, and it would confuse the daylights out of the world at large if you attempted to change that in your preaching of the message. But to Mary, the name was Joshua that he said to her by you know, the transliteration of English. That's what it would have meant if she's an English-speaking person. And his name was Joshua, and the importance of that... The significance of that is that the name Joshua, although it was a very common name, pointed to a, one of the most important his, uh, figures in Israel's history. He was a deliverer. He was a conqueror. He was a fighter. He was a warrior. All these things had to be going through her mind when the angel said, You're going to conceive and bear a son whose name is Joshua. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of, the, of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Who is this man? Well, he begins 
as an embryo. He was begotten in the womb of a woman who had never known a man by the Holy Spirit miraculously. The Holy Spirit, of course, is from him from the very, is full, he is full of the Holy Spirit right from the very beginning. But he is to be the salt, the son of the highest. He's to have the throne of David. He is to reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And now we're not today in the 20th century when I say, now, does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? All these things come to mind. All this awareness is already there for the name Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of, of the son of Joseph means a great deal to all of us. But here and now, these words, even though they had enormous import, I doubt seriously if they really registered on Mary at this point, if they really everything clicked for there was no frame of reference there was no awareness that you and i are looking back through 2000 years of a growth of understanding and of knowledge and of analysis and and of discussion and reading and study and so forth you know there's a lot of meaning in here for us but for her they were words and it came to her at a time when if it were not for the holy spirit she might not have even been able to put them all back together she was so stunned by the event that she was experiencing Mary said, How shall this be, seeing I don't know a man? And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Who is this man? He is the Son of God. He calls it that holy thing that is to be born of you. Now behold your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. And she entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's a pretty uh, impressive goings on. This is these, these staggering events. Here are just two women who come into each other's place. She just hears the voice in the other room, and the babe leaps in her womb because the awareness of John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, in the womb was aware of the presence of the Messiah. Who is this man? You and I? The Son of God. At this time, they are only beginning to grasp an awareness of who this one is to be. Just the beginning. No idea of the scope. No idea of the ministry. No idea of the sacrifice. No idea of the time frames of everything. Just the beginnings. And yet they are dealing with angels, talking to angels and exchanging words with angels, and two women carrying about in them babies filled with the Holy Spirit who are to revolutionize the world. Who is this man? Strange goings on these from the very beginning. Well, the, the angel leaped, I'm sorry, the, the babe leaped in her womb, and she herself was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of your salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Then Mary said, My soul does magnify, does exalt and honor the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. In an interesting choice of words, for that is the meaning of the name Joshua. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty has done to me great things. Holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and has exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich 
he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. You read them. The words are often very familiar because we've heard them in Christmas plays and, you know, we've seen them maybe on some little uh, play on television or, uh, of course, preachers, if you went to a church that observed Christmas, you've heard these read every year at the time of Christmas time when they go through Blessed Art Thou Among Women. And if you're a Catholic, of course, this is a part of the, the Hail Mary that you do so, so commonly. The Magnificat is something that's recited very often. That's, by the way, that's what this little statement of Mary is called. It's called the Magnificat of Mary. And it is indeed a very beautiful thing. It's, it's difficult for us to grasp what this means. The events that are, are coming down, to use the modern vernacular again. Mary abode with her about three months, and she returned to her own house, right about the time that John the Baptist was to be born. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. His mother said, No, he's going to be called John. And they said, Well, there's nobody in your family called by this name. And they made signs to his father, What do you want him to be called? He asked for a writing table, and he wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was open immediately, and his tongue loosed. And he spoke and praised God. And fear came upon all of those that dwelt round about them, and all these things were noised abroad through all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. But you see, it was to be thirty years before anything substantive really was going to come of either one of these two boys born in this same year. Thirty years before much really happened. Plenty of time for people to sort of forget to drift away from or to de-emphasize in their minds the events that took place here. Luke is recording them long, long after the ascension of Jesus Christ, and only after very carefully and painstakingly putting together all of the events and laying them out in order for all of us to read. And so it is, it said that uh, they heard, I'm sorry, they laid all these matters up in their hearts and said, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And Father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Zacharias, speaking under the Holy Spirit, states plainly that what is about to take place is that one who it is to come, who is the horn, and a horn in biblical parlance is symbolic of power. It has to do with the power of, and not the power of anything, but the power of salvation. And salvation probably meant more to people living in this time, and it meant something a little bit different from what it means to us living in the 20th century and here in, in Tyler and East Texas in the midst of absolutely incredible prosperity. Absolutely incredible prosperity. For the poorest among us are wealthy by standards of the ancient of the old world, where, where the, the livings were earned with the sweat of one's brow, and hard scrabble, and life was hard and difficult, and one worked from could to couldn't, basically, was when you did, from can to can't, as they say. I can work, so I work when I can't do it anymore, I quit and lay down my tools. And that's the way it was done in these times. They looked for salvation from the Roman heel, from the Romans, the army. They were an occupied people. They had no rights. No rights at all. You and I take so many of our rights for granted. We are protected by the law. We are protected in so many ways that people can't do certain things to us. They could be arrested in the prison without charge. They could be beaten and punished without being, being even being brought before a judge. They could, in many cases, have their lives taken away from them by someone without even being taken before a judge. It was a, a hard time. And people were praying for salvation and praying for the Messiah. And here they had at long last been given a hint. He's on the way. This one, this John, is to prepare the way before him. We should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy, verse 72, promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation 
unto his people by the remission of sin, that by, and through the tender mercy of God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the desert until the day of his showing to Israel. He was away. He didn't grow up quite like Jesus did in the shadow of his father's business, working and uh, in, involved in commerce day to day and business dealings and making contracts and finishing houses and taking payments from different people. John was away and in the wilderness, stayed away from civilization essentially for his entire life until the time of his revealing or his showing to Israel. Then comes the very familiar passage of the, of the birth of Christ, the announcement of it, and, and of all that was to take place in Bethlehem, it's all tremendously inspirational and, and, and is worthy of your rereading it and rereading it and rereading it to ponder on the events that took place there. To realize that when people would say, well, who is this man? That the only answer to that question is, this man is the Son of God. He is human and he is divine. He is a man and he is very God in the flesh difficult in the abstract to grapple with what that meant in the flesh. To actually see, to know, to walk up and down the trails with him, to get dusty and dirty with him on the road, to sleep alongside him at night, to hear him teach day in and day out, to be with him during quiet times, intensive times, and times of prayer, to be with him in moments of temptation and trouble and uh, frustration, to go through all these things and actually see the man who is the Son of God live all these things must have been an absolutely staggering experience. And for those men, the name Jesus Christ was slowly becoming very, very meaningful. Well, it means a lot to us now, but we have to remember that, it, that, that in this time, the name didn't mean anything to very many people at all. In chapter 3, the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country around about Jordan, preaching the, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. As it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitude that came forth, Be baptized, you generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abel Abraham. Now is the axe laid to the root of the tree. Every tree which brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. And the people said, What shall we do then? Boy, this was an old-time preacher, wasn't he? He was a powerhouse, apparently, even when he got up to preach. He did not spare his words. He looked them right in the eye and said, You generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And yet they came. He treated them roughly, in some ways verbally. He called a spade a spade. He told them to repent. He laid out specific responsibilities for specific people. He said, what are we supposed to do? And he said, he that has two coats, let him impart to him that doesn't have one. He that has food, let him do likewise. The publicans came to be baptized. He said, Master, what shall we do? He said, exact no more than that which is appointed of you. This man is practical. He's down to earth. He's not dealing in, in esoteric, far-out spiritual doctrines. He's dealing with the way you deal with people day in and day out in your life. The soldier said, what shall we do? And he said, don't do violence to any man and be content with your wages, and so on as he goes. As the people were in expectation, verse 15, all men used in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. And you see, they, they really didn't know. They did not know what to expect, except that they realized that the Christ could actually look like John the Baptist. He could look like anyone in this room. You could have put him up with a whole group of people and said, now, one of those men in that group is the Messiah. You pick him out, and you would never. You'd have had no more chance. If there were 100 men, you'd have had one chance in 100 of getting him, and that's it. Pure chance. For there was nothing to 
to designate him in appearance or even in his name as far as that's concerned for his name was common ordinary everyday name just as common as joe or josh or any of the things that we might name our boys like david or sam or what have you so they didn't know and they looked at him and they said well i wonder it gives you a hint in a way as to, as to their expectations and and what they thought he would be they certainly thought the messiah was going to be a man so they were astonished at what he was saying and they had to begin to wonder and John answered, saying unto you, I indeed baptize you with water, mightier than I come, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus said of John the Baptist, there has not been born of women a greater than John the Baptist. The man was a powerful preacher. And so strong, in fact, that as people listened to him, they began to think that he might very well indeed be the Messiah. You and I would respect John. We would hold him in considerable esteem. We would hang on his words. We would, like this one man did, call him master, which basically is just the word for teacher. We would consider him a leader among us all and a, and a, and a spiritual powerhouse. And John said, of the one to come who would look much like John, you know, his outward appearance would be much the same. If you cut him, he would bleed. He had to eat food to stay alive. He had to wear clothes to keep warm. He said of this one who was coming after me, I am not worthy to unlatch his shoes, much less wash his feet. How this man? Does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? Now, when I ask you that question at first, you say, oh, sure, yeah, absolutely, the name Jesus Christ means anything. Okay, what? What does the name Jesus Christ mean? For indeed, as a parent, how do you approach him if and when you do? How do you feel about this one whom John the Baptist, whom you would have respected in a very highly, said, I am not worthy to unlatch his shoes? The old question, what think you of Christ? Uh, it's uh, pretty relevant when you think of it in these terms and in these ways. Pretty strong words. John said of him, I am not worthy to unloose his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. For sand is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by John for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, for John was a social philosopher or commentator as well, he did, did not hesitate to speak quite plainly about the evils that were done in high office. He added, that yet this above all, that he shut John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. And then, of course, he continues with his genealogy and with the things that he did. John is put in prison. Jesus now is in a position to begin his ministry. He's about 30 years of age. And at the moment of his baptism, there is this outward manifestation deliberately done by God of a dove, something he has never done for any other human being who's ever lived, who was descended upon Jesus and the voice said, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, we say, uh, does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? We're talking about the Son of God, whom he honored as he has honored no other, and whom he has said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and to whom all, to all mankind he has said, You hear him. Pretty strong stuff that we read. I want you to turn back with me, if you will, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 19. John chapter 1 and verse 19. This is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? 
And he confessed and he didn't deny. He said, I am not the Christ. And they said, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you that prophet? He said, no. They said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those that sent us. What do you say of yourself? His answer, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they said, well, why are you baptizing them if you're not Christ or Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you know not. He it is whom coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unleash loose. These things, he said, were done beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That little short phrase is the object of one of the most beautiful passages that's ever been put to music, and, and, you know, as far as I know. The passage out of Hand, uh, Handel's Messiah, Behold, the Lamb of God. I never fail to hear it but, and be so deeply and profoundly moved by that. Who does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? Who is this man? Well, John, when he saw him, said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Every sin of all men, your sin and my sin, were laid upon him. And the expression, the Lamb of God, very meaningful to John and to every one of his hearers round about. For the Lamb of God is the Passover Lamb. It is that Lamb which, which is a sacrifice for our sins. It is that Lamb which takes away the sin of the entirety of the world. Does the name Jesus Christ mean that to you? The Lamb of God that taketh away the, the sin of the world? Very powerful word, please, that John spoke. This is he of whom I said there comes after me, a man preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come, baptizing with water. And John bore record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it bowed upon him. And I knew him not, but, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Notice he says, I knew him not. Twice he says, I didn't know him. He says in verse 31, I knew him not, except the one that sent me told me what to look for. I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize told me what to look for. Twice he makes that same statement. John the Baptist, when, when Jesus came walking down, did not know him because of who he was, or because of his name, or because of his family. He knew him because of the revelation of God only. So when people would say, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Or does the name Jesus of Nazareth mean anything? Because the only answer for most people, and indeed the only answer for John would have been, no, it doesn't mean anything to me, unless he happened to recall the physical relationship that existed, the family relationship, and that he was the son of Mary. But you see, John had been away for 30 years and did not know Jesus, did not know him by sight. So they said, you know that man, prior to the revelation, John would have had to say, no, he doesn't mean anything to me. Funny, isn't it, how today we can know so much, or at least think we do. And back in this time, there was a point in time when you'd ask that question, does the name Jesus Christ mean anything? And people would say, what? Name who? Who? Where? Uh, and would be absolutely ignorant of, of what it mean, meant, even John the Baptist. Only was to know him by the revelation of Almighty God. There is so much to be pointed out. I want you to go back with me to the fourth chapter of Luke again to a, a fascinating encounter. Now, Jesus has begun his ministry at this point in time. There has been some preaching. There have been miracles performed. And he comes to Nazareth, Luke 4 and verse 16, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, if you had asked these people, does the name Jesus, or let's say Joshua in this particular case, the son of Joseph, mean anything to you? They said, oh yeah, oh yeah, we've known him. Uh, he helped us build our house. He and his father worked on the job, worked hard. I remember them very well. They were 
uh, perhaps a little bit, uh, uh, you know, long in the hours they work sometimes. They're pretty hard working. Uh, but boy, they sure did good quality work and, and worked hard at it. I believe his father is uh, dead, isn't he? If you ask who he was, when he walked up and down the streets, there would be people who would greet him. There would be someone who walked up and slapped him on the shoulder. When he walked into the synagogue, he would be invited to read. He was a man. And he was a respected man, for until the time that Jesus began his ministry, he was in favor with God and with man. They liked him. There was no reason for them not to like him. A fine man, an upstanding man, very well known. Now we have come to a place where the man is known. He is recognized when he walks into the room. And they say, would you read? And he stands. It was customary, by the way, to stand when you read from the Bible and you sat when you teach. Normally, the way of teaching was to sit and teach. The only reason for the standing was out of respect for the Word of God. So they always stood when they read. So it was delivered to him, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That in itself is interesting because it's a reference to the year of release, in which prisoners were let go, in which debts were forgiven, when the people were able to go back to their land, a time of freeing of all people, the removal of sin, the, the removal of gift is all symbolized very strongly by the preaching of the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book. He gave it back to the servant there, and he sat down. Sitting down is to teach. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to say to them, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. What an astonishing thing to say. Who is this man who can make that kind of statement? Who is this man who can sit there and read out of the prophets? The time has come. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. Now, the word anointed is actually from the same root as the word Messiah. In fact, the word Messiah means the anointed one. And so when he said, God has anointed me, he is making, he is taking, at that moment in time, he is claimed to be the Messiah, the anointed of God. It is at this moment of time that he identifies himself, as a matter of fact, as Jesus Christ for the first time. For here he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, reading from Isaiah, and says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And everyone bore him witness, and they wondered at the gracious words that came out of his mouth, and they said, isn't this a Josephson? Isn't this one of the Josephson family? Well, we've known him. He's been around here. I've done business with, with, his, with his father. I mean, I went to his dad's funeral when he died. And, and we kind of wondered, you know, about some of the things then. Who is this kid? You know, we've heard about things he's done somewhere else. And Jesus said, you're probably going to say to me this proverb. Position here yourself. Whatever we've heard you have done in Capernaum, why don't you do this here in your own country? And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. This is sobering. You know, it, it, it's mind-boggling. It, it, it's very difficult for me to understand, in a way, and, and it probably wouldn't be expected to be so after all these years, and, and considering the handicap you and I labor under. But when we know all that we know, and we say, well, now, does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? And boy, we can tell our pages and pages and pages of what the name Jesus Christ means. And we know he's the Son of God, and we know the power of the Most High is upon him, and we know he's healed the sick, and he's changed lives. And here he is with a group of people, and, and they don't, they, they just can't accept him. How could that be? They just didn't understand. He goes on to say, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And he was not. I tell you the truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, and the heaven was shut up three years and six months, great famine throughout the land. Elijah was not sent to any of them except Sarepta, a city of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. That's interesting, isn't it? Here's Israel, widows all over the place, and time of famine, and people are going to be dying like flies here and yon because of the lack of food. And he's not sent to any of those widows in Israel. He sent all the way up the coast of Sidon to a widow who is a Gentile. And he goes on to say, and there were lepers, many lepers, 
in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and not one of them was cleansed. Who was cleansed? Naaman, a Syrian from another country, was cleansed in those days. And everyone in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and they rose up, and they thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill. They wanted to cast him down, throw him all the way down the hill headlong. But he passed through the middle of them and went on his way. How could they do that? How could they possibly react to this man that way? Jesus was no stranger here. He was well known. But he was known, you see, only as Joseph's son. He was a prophet without honor. And when I read this, the thought occurred to me, is it possible that Jesus could ever be a prophet without honor to his own church? Is it possible that he could ever be a prophet without honor to his own church? Think about it. These people were absolutely furious at the suggestion that God would work outside of Israel. Israel, prophetically speaking, is a type of the church. Could we ever become furious at the thought that God might work outside of what we would recognize as the church? Do you realize that from time immemorial, from the very beginning, and whatever church you want to look at, people have? They have been jealous. Do they Catholics? Do they Protestants? Do they whatever? They have been jealous that God might work outside of what they themselves think is the body, the church, the organization, the structure, or whatever it is. That one might look at. It's really kind of interesting, I think, to think about that. I wonder why that is true. Familiarity breeds contempt, the old saying. These people thought they knew him, didn't they? They'd seen him many times. He walked in, they saw his face, they knew him, they knew his name, they knew his history up until this time for the most part. They thought they knew him. But they didn't know him at all. We also think we know him. Don't we? How well do we know it? Do we know him as well as we think we do? You take a look at how profoundly and how violently they reacted to him. That in itself, I think, is very revealing. And I want you to turn back with me to John, the first chapter, one more time. The first chapter of John, in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing. Everything. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness just could not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light. He was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world didn't know it. Incredible. The world was made by him. The rocks, the stones, the trees, the, the valleys, the elements in the earth, all this oil that we pump up and run around our cars, and the whole world was made by him. And the world didn't know him. And he says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, Jesus came to his own today. Now, here, I don't mean in his... Parousia. I don't mean in his return to the earth ultimately in vengeance and in fire. I mean if he came to his own today, where would he come? Where would he go? Well, you know, we sort of think probably his own would be Christians. It would be the church, as it were. If he came to, let's say, the Catholic Church, and he suggested, as Joshua Josephson, that this idea of birth control in the modern world, of no birth control in the modern world, was really impractical, that, that we really need to rethink this because the population explosion is going to run us all out of food, people are going to be dying horribly, and you really have gotten hold of the wrong end of this. I really think you need to rethink this idea of against birth control. Would he be received 
Or would someone say, well, you know, the, uh, the Pope decided many years, many, many generations ago, that, that birth control was a sin. And since the Pope is infallible, uh, then that can't, it can't be possible. What you were saying cannot be true. And here, the one who is the one who knows, the one who made all things could come if they were his own, to them and suggest, well, now you are mistaken here. You need to correct this. Would he be received? Or if he went, let's say, got into a Christian science reading room somewhere, and in chatting with someone, he decided to suggest, well, I really don't think you've got the right angle on this thing. It is really better to keep on living and, and loving your wife and feeding your children uh, without your appendix than it is to die of appendicitis. Let, you know, let, let's reason together. Would he be accepted? Well, no, because their prophet long ago made it clear certain things about healing and divine healing, and, and the prophet is dead and therefore cannot reevaluate any of her, her uh, things that she said. And so they're kind of stuck with it. I think he probably would not be received. And I wonder that if he showed up on the doorstep of some American Legion building someday to uh, visit the church of, you know, the, the uh, services of one of the worldwide Church of God churches somewhere, and he wandered in, if he was allowed even to enter the door as Joshua Josephson, uh, and after services he was sitting around talking with someone, he said, well, not really. Uh, the administration of the church has thoroughly misinterpreted those Old Testament scriptures about makeup. It's not wrong for a woman to wear makeup. There's nothing, you know, it's just colored stuff they put on the face, try to make themselves look better. There's nothing serious here. It's not important. We do receive. I suspect his treatment would vary only in, in the degree of violence with what actually happened to Jesus when he, in a synagogue, suggested that God might work outside of what they perceived to be the limits of God's religion. They grabbed hold of him, and they took him out of here, and they were going to throw him down the side of the hill. They probably, nowadays, because of the law and rights and so forth, would only escort the man holding both elbows to the door and with one hand his back, propel him into the, you know, out on the steps and down and out into the parking lot. Would be about as far as anyone would go. But I suspect that is the way he would be received. Now, if he came to the Church of God International, and he suggested that if we don't stop biting and accusing one another, he'll get somebody else to do the job, would we receive him? Maybe. What's probably more likely, though, is that we would tolerate it. And you know, it's just not the same somehow, being tolerated as opposed to being received, accepted, obeyed, loved, honored, cherished. It's just not the same. You look again at John, chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But to as many as received him, to them gave ye power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Does the name Jesus Christ mean anything to you? Because to those that receive him, no, they don't just tolerate him. They don't argue with him. They don't bicker with him. They don't get involved in law. They, they receive him and accept him, and what he says, they do. To those people, he gave the power, the right, to become sons of God. Those people which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Does Jesus Christ mean anything to you? How can you tell?